made man. This is the section we're going to talk about today of the creed. Anybody know what that picture is right there? Okay, okay, that's not, that's not, that's not false. Wh what is, what's the name of that picture, do you know? Anybody know? It's Michelangelo, yes, and it's the creation of Adam. Okay, so I put this up first, just to remind us always that in the beginning, God created man from dirt and the, and the breath of God. So this is, this depicts God creating Adam, okay? And what we're talking about today is, is this is a scene um, by Raphael, and this is the, where, where you see uh, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, and the gifts are being brought to, brought to them. And um, you have heaven, you know, almost like heavenly beings around and um, visitors to welcome the incarnation. The, the, that the fact that, that God is now among us. Whoa. Okay. And so what I've done here is I've put little numbers on this. This is how I'm going to break this down. We're going to talk today about for us and for our salvation. So you see the numbering, right? So I'm going to break that down first. Okay. So first, read this quote from Athanasius, which I'm going to end with, with his book. He actually wrote a book called on the Incarnation. Remember, Athanasius, at, th in, at the Council of Nicaea, he was a scribe to his bishop. But by the time Constant, uh, the Council of Chalcedon comes around, it, it is Athanasius' penned response that is, is ratified, and that's the, that's the verbiage we have been using now for 17, 1,600 years. So it's kind of, he's, he's a big player in this. The self-revealing of the word is in every dimension, above in creation, below in the incarnation, in the depth in Hades, in the breath throughout the world. All things have been filled with the knowledge of God. And it's bringing heaven to earth is this incarnational part we're going to look at. So the first thing is, is we're going to look at is the for us. Okay, so any, anybody have their Bibles open? Please open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is going to be, uh, so I, I put all, I was going to put these up bullet points, but nah. So some of you might want to get some of these other passages up and, up and ready. Whoever gets it first, just read those two verses, please. 2 Corinthians 5. Yes. So we are convinced that, that Christ came in 14. Um, yeah, that Christ love compels because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore all died. Yeah, and so, so this is the for us. This is this is one of the reasons why God uh, sent His Son. God came in the flesh because there's a purpose to us. He came for us, for all. He died for all. Okay, there's a purpose there. Okay. Right, and, and so it's this, this, act of, this act of having heaven and earth come together, who, who, for whose benefit? For all of mankind. We are all blessed because of this self-sacrificing act. He was, he's able to do in himself immeasurably more than we can do collectively. So this is, this is a purpose, it's for all, okay? And, and so that's for us and for our salvation. Anybody have Colossians? Okay. Start of a sentence. Yeah, yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please do. 
And although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond your reproach. Yeah, so he, so the imperishable word I put there is he takes what's dying or in some cases, what's dead, and he what? Like he did with Adam? He breathes life into us. He brings us from temporal people to what? Eternal people. This is amazing. This is what he does for us and for our salvation. The body dies. The spirit, however, goes on. And it's this wedding of the taking what's perishable, me, and, and uniting it with something that's imperishable. This is what he does. This is for our salvation. It's bringing us, it's, it's, it's getting us into a condition where we can be with God now and how long? Forever. That relationship isn't when we die and go to heaven. It starts now. He's bringing us to an imperishable bliss. Okay, so that's why we can walk as Christians. We can walk confidently with God. Because for us and for our salvation, in, in what salvation then talks about, and we're not going to get that to that right now, is being able to be in a right relationship as Jesus, the bridegroom, and us, the bride, we are now united and wed together. This is great. Okay. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Okay, here's another purpose statement. Anybody have the John 3, uh, John 6? You just start reading if, when you get it. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Keep going. Keep going. But this is the will of him who sent me. Yeah. That of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him, will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Oh, that gives you goose pimples there, boy, I'll tell you, All right? See, so that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing purpose. I came down, I came down, and visited you. Why? So that I could present you holy and blameless for the Father. And so this is amazing. So this is a purpose. Statement. I have come down. So we have, I have, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. Okay. What do you think that, what, what do you think that is like for God to abandon his his post, so to speak, and say, oh, is any, anywhere in Scripture, anybody, you know, there's lots of places in Scripture about the parable of um, the master who owns the, vine, uh, the, the vineyards, and he says, well, I'm going to send my hired servants to go and see, and what do they do? They kill them, and, that's, and then he says, he says, well, surely if I send my son, I'll get, I'll get you know, they can collect the money and that. And what do they do? They kill the heir. And so, in, in interesting that, that, that these parables teach us that um, from the beginning, this was, we know historically and theologically that, that it's, it, in, order, in order to rescue and to do justice to the corporate separation of mankind before God, it takes not just a sacrifice, it takes a divine sacrifice. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get towards the end of the, of the creed. 
because we're going to have to put a wrap wrap this up a little bit. But um, so God God already knew what kind of that He would have to come Himself. But that that in that is some of the things that we've been struggling with the last couple weeks, and that is the dual nature of being fully Christ and fully human, and and wrestling with well. You know, Jesus, he had an easier time because he was God. He knows all these things. Did he? Well, the answer is yes. But as Patrick reminded us even last week out of the Christ, the Christ hymn in Philippians, that he decided to forego that kind of knowledge in order that he could make the eye contact and the life contact with us. And I think it's one of the most impressive things about the apostolic ministry and why there wasn't, there wasn't as much heresy as you might think of in the early part of the church. Because if, if Bill started talking crazy stuff about Jesus, there were a lot of witnesses, and Scripture says again and again, oh, no, no, Th these are the things we heard him say. These are the things we witnessed him doing. You're not pulling that stuff on us. It wasn't until a couple generations later that a lot of the heretical stuff started to creep in and things. But even then, this church was still strong, as even Patrick last week was talking about the, some of the early church voices of Tertullian and Origen and others would really, really had some great, great ideas of what, how we worship on a Sunday morning, for example. And why is it that we take bread and break bread? And why do we share a cup? Why? Well, because this, these are the things that all his followers witnessed him doing. They, they, they saw this. They partook of this. So this is amazing. So this is another thing where he comes down from heaven. He leaves his, his place. Which basically, let me ask you this. What do you think of heaven? Give me some ideas. Tell me what you think heaven's like. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, angels, little, 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 little fat cherubs, you know, and you know, little arrows running around. No, okay. I mean, everything is worshiping God. Everything is bowing down and glorifying God. And I, my mind can't conceive of this. I, I, I try to picture this, and I just can't. But it's total worship and total the love of God. And they're, they're, All right. It's glory. Yeah, it is. Okay, so I, I'm going to pick up on it. So everything in Revelation, this picture is everything is bowed down in worship of God, right? Okay, but what is doing that? Angels. Angels and the 12 um, tribes. The elders. of the Yeah, and then, and then all kinds of other things. Things. Yeah, yeah. weird creatures. Yeah. All these like, what? What's going on here? Right? Right, right, right. So heaven is, heaven is kind of like out of a, yeah, like a Salvador Dali something, you know. It's like, isn't it? Okay, what other, other pictures of heaven? Okay, the lamb. What is that? What is that, Lee? What is that? The lamb that was sacrificed. The lamb of God that was sacrificed. Okay. Yeah, so that, 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 that is an element that represents heaven, okay. See, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's not easy to say, hey, describe heaven. Young lady? I think the, what's the streets of gold and pearls, and I'm just thinking, I'm sure. thinking inside of a treasure chest. I don't know why sure. I'm bringing things up, but something like that. Right. That's your whole world. Yeah, uh, John paints that picture of the holy city of Jerusalem and, you know, walking on, and, and so basically it's, the things that are precious, and God acknowledges those are precious. He says, yeah, even the things that I recognize as precious, you'll just walk on them. It's not, it's not as precious as you think. So. The people from all the time of the world, that we haven't seen it. And they'll be holy, and they'll be what's holy is called. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't wait to be in the presence of God with, with the multitude of believers because it's then and only then will I'll understand Hindi. Because I'm not gonna I'm not gonna understand it now, brother. I'll tell you that. <laughs> it, but I'll be able to understand it then. So <laughs> kind of like at Pentecost, it's like, hey, these farmers are speaking to us and we could understand him. And I'm like, oh, why can't it be that easy for me? It's not easy. One one Cliff. I have a less physical concept of heaven, I think. I, I think of a place where there is no hate, there's only love. A place where there is no darkness, only light. A place where you don't have to worry about evil people lurking in the shadows. Because there aren't any shadows and there aren't any evil people. Yeah, so... So basically, heaven is just like the place you dwell, we dwell right now. But without um, the things that are not of God. I'm going to prepare a, a mansion, a place, and all these things that John tries to conceptualize are beautiful. Is this, do you think this is figurative language? Do you think it's literal? Well, it all depends on, um, yeah, it's, I, I, I personally think it's all a uh, metaphor. It's, it's, um, it, it's yeah, um, ma mansions, um, uh, that's kind of language that that we understand. Um, basically, it's a special place. You, 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 you have, you believe it or not, are a person of royalty. And when's the last time you felt that you were an honored daughter or son of God? It's it's hard for us to get there, because every time I look in the mirror, I, I I don't I don't see that. I don't experience that. The world that I live in, they think I'm evil. Many of the people think I'm, I'm nuts. I believe in God. I have an education. You know, I have this, whatever. It's like, you're the bad guy. It's like, no. God, God, God so loved me that he's, he's prepared a mansion for me, a dwelling. And, and, and what mansion is it? It's it, what... And what you learn in this is, I don't care. I'm in the presence of God. See, that, that's, it's like, like Cliff was saying, it's not more of like a place. It's more of a, so, so think of that. Whatever that is, whatever your mind can conceive. Well, Jesus came down from there, from, from whatever. And he, and he left that. And he says, oh, I'm going to go to Milwaukee. Now I'm going to drink. Pabst Blue Ribbon or something. And they're like, oh no, Jesus, what are you hanging around with with those <laughs> with those tax collectors and those sinners? <laughs> hey, what are you calling a tax collector and sinner, right? Okay, so he came down from heaven, this place, to do a purpose by the power. What's the Luke Lukean passage? Anybody have that yet? Luke 1. Just read it when you get it. This is uh, yep. an angel talking to Mary, mm -hmm. saying that you're going to have a kid. This mm -hmm. kid's going to be really, really special. Mm -hmm. And Mary says, well, how can this be? Oh, I don't have a husband or a man. Yeah. Or so this is the angel's answer. Mm -hmm. The angel answered her and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. Yeah, so it's, it, I, I, I just... I like this term, the overshadower with power. Okay, it's not, it's not by Mary's decision. See, see, again, remember, Mary does something that Sarah... Abraham's wife doesn't do. When Sarah is told, hey, you're going to be with child, she's, ha! She laughs, and because it doesn't happen right away, she decides to give her servant, Hagar, to her husband to, have, to 
bear a child for her. This is how it worked back in the day, right? I don't think we should do that. So not by a husband's, what's that? It is, yeah, it never works out, yeah. It, <laughs> so not by a husband's prerogative, not by the planning of, of, of a woman. We cannot do this. The overshadower comes in. By the power of God, this happens. This is what happens. It, it is, how did, how did Mary become pregnant? Yes, by the overshadower. It is, it is a divine act. And that's an amazing thing. Okay, so, so that we're going we're gonna to hold it right there for now. We're going to unpack that a little bit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the power, so the Holy Spirit, so by the power of the Holy Spirit, Romans, the first four verses of Romans. Anybody have that? Okay. I, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as his human nature was descended of power to be son of God. Keep going. By his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay. So it's by the power of God, the overshadower does comes and says, shows up and says, okay, out of the pool, we're fixing this. And of the Holy Spirit. And that, that brilliant ent entry into the book of Romans is just, it, it's another one of those breathtakers. And who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, but here we're still talking about the, the, the but so, so you bookend, when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about, you know, his, in, uh, his incarnation, but the purpose on it is shown in these passages because obviously Romans is written with a fuller story post-resurrection and things, but it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that these things happen. Next, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate. John 1.14, it's one, go ahead, go ahead, Bill. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right. So that's the conclusion on the Gospel of John's prologue, um, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then that he became flesh, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. We have seen this. So he becomes incarnate. The Word, as uh, the, the, the non-literal, the logos of God, the one that created the universe, spoke the universe in existence, this this ethereal word becomes what? Flesh. And dwells among us. Sometimes I sent, um, I sent to Kevin. I, I haven't been home in a few days, and I'm, I'm on my way home actually after church. And I, I had an outline here. Aren't you glad I'm not reading from my 17-page outline? I will do a little bit of that, but... Um, I had him print this, okay, so I sent him an email with a PDF, okay, and then he opens it up on a computer and he prints this, and when I got in this morning, this is sitting right here on the, on the pew, okay, this did not exist until he hit print, okay, so God, the Logos, is here, the very word of God, the very presence of God, the very usias or substance of God. And then he's born of a woman in Palestine and becomes 
he's here tonight. And people got to hold him. Oh. So he becomes, the word becomes flesh. From the Virgin Mary, Matthew uh, 21, 22, and 23. Anybody? Good. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin shall be the child and will give birth to the son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yeah. So the Matthew quote, that was a quote from the book of Isaiah. Okay, so Isaiah prophesied this 700 years prior to this. Okay, and he says, quote, Behold, the virgin will be a child. And, and, and so the, this, this idea is it, it meant something in, at the time of Isaiah, but it has an eternal purpose because it was um, predicting that God was sent his son in a similar manner manner like this and uh, so uh, that we can talk about so the theotokos that term theotokos is um, God bearer that um, it's interesting so he God I think I said this before I'll say it again God creates the heavens and the earth and the earth exists and from earth from matter that was already existent he creates man so we're like we're kind of like man and woman. We're the kind of last part of creation. Think about that. We're, we're like ancillary additions, for example. But, but then scripture tells us that we're made in his image and that we're higher than the angels. That's a head, that's a head scratcher. Um, but so that we have that. So he creates Adam and he creates Eve from Adam. And so then, so Eve at the end of creation of woman, which you could argue that that's the highest part of his creation. So thank you, ladies, for being part of the highest form of creation. He starts with woman to reverse the process. He starts with woman and plants the divine seed in her. That just that just doesn't take your breath away, boy. So Mary becomes this chosen person. And, and where we don't, where, where we can appreciate her, even revere her for being the, the bearer of God, the, the mother of God. And I'm okay with that. We just don't worship her the way some people. And I, I even, even pump, some people might think that other denominations worship Mary or pray to Mary. Most, most of the time it's praying with Mary and just having a high regard for her. Because Mary, even to me, even as much as I might love my mother, Mary occupies a, a, a special place because she represents the absolute best of, of mankind and of women in general because she said yes. And she endured. And she made it possible. And all of this, without that, there's no cross. So, so Mary, the virgin, yeah. and was made man. Anybody the last one? Hebrews? Yeah. had flesh and blood. He too shared in the humanity so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of Jesus came and shared in our humanity that he might destroy the things that are destroying us. So it's, it's very clear. Scripture is very clear. Paints this picture. I could put many, many other scriptures up. That of unpacking this. The incarnation. Concepts of the incarnation. So, Madeline Lengel wrote... There is nothing so secular that it cannot be sacred. And that is one of the deepest messages of the incarnation. That no matter how bad the world gets, God will rescue us. And 
what, when you see a rainbow, what does the rainbow signify? No, the, the, the yeah, yeah, good. If you have to spank you if you said other things, but um, the rainbow is the covenant. But what is, yeah, but what? What does it give? It's a, a symbol of hope. Why? He's not going to do it that way again. <laughs> he, he'll, he's going to wash the world. He's going to wash the world. Yeah, but it's not going to be in water. It's going to be in what? The blood of Christ. Well, the fire, that's the renovation of the world, right? But he is right now washing the world in the blood of Jesus Christ. He is taking us and he is making us spotless in the blood of Christ. He's no longer going to eradicate us with water. The rainbow signifies his hope and the covenant, right? But he's washing us in the blood. And so the Jesus is, uh, just a few things, Jesus is the, usi, the second usias, the substance of the Trinity, okay? Father, Son, and then we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit when that comes up. Um, and that's the third, obviously, third part. So he is fully divine and fully human. And there are three Christological truths that I'll, I, I do would like to read um, some of those this morning. I have to skip over. See how many pages I'm skipping over? Okay. It is, he is truly the Son of God who is man. This truth emphasizes that Jesus must true, be truly the divine Son of God uh, at the Council of Nicaea, uh, upheld this truth against Arius, who conceived the Son of God to be a perf to be a perfect though created being, and thus not truly divine. The Council stated that the Son of God was light from light, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. What is made is always a different nature, a different kind of being from the maker. What is begotten is always the same nature, the same kind of being as the begetter. Okay, so that's that, and you know, so the other other thing is, it is truly man that is the son of God is. It is truly man that the son of God is. From an incarnational perspective, it is of no value to uphold the full divinity of the Son if that Son is not truly and fully human. Thus, the early church condemned both the Doicists, who claimed that Jesus' humanity was a mere pretense in that he merely took on the appearance of a man, but not really not the reality of a man. And Apollinarius, who, de who denied that Jesus had a, had a human soul, the Son of God, if he were to save, must live in an authentic and genuine human life. And therefore, he must be truly and fully human in every way except sin. And the third is the Son of God truly is man. This truth accentuates the fact that the incarnational becoming must terminate in an incarnational is. The divine Son and the man Jesus cannot be separate beings. The Son of God must actually exist as man. The Son of God must be man. Here, the early church at the Council of Ephesus condemned Nestorius. Nestorius believed that if the son actually became man, it would mean that the son would undergo change and mutation so that and so would lose his divine transcendent perfection. God cannot be born or hunger or weep or suffer or die. However, the early church grasped in faith that it was the whole point of the incarnation. The whole point of the incarnation was that he would share in every way with us 
except in our pollution. Again, upholding the full divinity and the full humanity of the Son of God is of no value if the Son of God does not actually exist as a man. For it is through the Son's human existence, his human, his human birth of Mary, the mother of God, his human life, especially his human death and resurrection, that the divine Son of God inaugurates our salvation Thus, the Council of Chalcedon, who ratifies the Nicene Creed, declared that it is, quote, one and the same Son who is truly God and truly man. The one Son who is God as the Father is God, is God is the same Son who is man as other human beings are human. So he is as much God as God, and he is as much human as you and me. Whew. Okay, so that's a mouthful. And then the incarnation starts this redemptive process, as I mentioned uh, just before. Rowan Williams, uh, um, former Archbishop of Canterbury, I like this quote. It's almost like in C.S. Lewis-ness. What right has non-worldly a discarnate God to forgive any human being. He is, he is not to be found. His grace and mercy are not to be found anywhere but in the past of human violence. So without, with a discarnate God, how does he make connection with us? How does he make connection with us? Um, I'll read this. This is part of the creed that talks mostly about the incarnation. We confess one and the same God, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial at the same time with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood like us in all things except sin, begotten before all ages of the Father, according to the Godhead, and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to one man, to the one manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the difference of the natures being by no means taken away because of the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one substance not divided or separated into two persons, but one and the same God and only begotten God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ. This I'm expecting to be memorized by next. Yeah, memorize this one. Okay. This book on the incarnation, this, this, this patristic series, this this as many of the early church fathers, their, their, their writings are on this. And the school that um, publishes this series is the one that uh, actually Patrick went to. St. Vladimir, St. Vladimir's up in New York. Anyways, on the incarnation, you can buy this. I wish I had copies to give to everybody, but I don't. The body of the word, then, being of real human body, in spite of its having been uniquely formed from a virgin, was of itself mortal and, like other bodies, liable to death. But the indwelling of the word loosed it from this natural liability so that corruption could not touch it. Thus, it happened that two opposite marvels took place at once. The death of all was consummated in the Lord's body, yet because the word was in it, 
death and corruption were in the same act utterly abolished. <sighs> There's another goose bump, goose pimply one. So listen, when you read stuff like this, sometimes it's not easy to get our minds around, but please, I'm begging you, don't look back at men and women of the past and think, oh, we're much smarter than they are now. I'm telling you, there are men and women in church history that bring me to tears. I'm like, how did they get it? How did they get it a thousand years ago? And we st still are struggling with this today. See, so, yeah. And so the nativity, the uh, nativity mystery, conceived from the Holy Spirit and born from the Virgin Mary means that God became human, truly human, out of his own grace. The miracle of the existence of Jesus, his climbing down of God, is Holy Spirit and Virgin Mary. Here is a human being, the Virgin Mary, and as he comes from God, Jesus comes also from this human being. Born of the Virgin Mary means a human origin for God. Jesus Christ is not only truly God, he is human like every one of us. He is human without limitation. He is not only similar to us, he is like us. The great... Um, Neo-Orthodox, well, comes from a Lutheran background, Karl Barth. So, any additions to this? Yeah. What ancient philosopher, Christian philosopher, apologist went through, we still are going through that in certain countries where we are in minority that we have to prove Christ is God, fully God, fully human being. And they have done an excellent job. That time probably didn't know but nobody. The third century yeah. was Christ. Christianity was right. developing, was evolving. Right. And even though it had been evolved, we still face those kind of questions. Exactly. And I, I think sometimes the best thing to do is... When we're engaging with people, um, listen, take their questions. When you're listening to, uh, in, like, in, in, like in India, Pakistan, uh, things where you have a mixture between uh, Hinduism or now Islam, of course, and they, they, it's, it's not logical to have both God and man come together. Um, it, it, we do pre-apologetics to try to prove that, well, it doesn't seem like it's logical, but if God exists, as you believe God exists, why are you putting a limitation on God that says he, it can't happen this way? If God is God, so sometimes what you want is a dualistic mode where we want to worship God as long as God never bothers me. Stay out of my life. Is there religious books say that? Yes, exactly. Very difficult to deal right. with that. And that, exactly, and bec it's because a lot of it, as, as we know, as the development of this happens, it's if you let the Nestoriuses and the Ariuses and the Apollinariuses go, that heretical line will come and continue to grow, and then certain people groups will attach on it, like, for example, what happened when our brotherhood, a couple um, people from our own brotherhood, took a, 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 mixed, a mixed message out to Utah. And they, and, they, and they literally were out there isolated for 100 years. And by the time everything started to come back together and our nation kind of grew and came together, well, now we have a whole sect of people that came right out of the Christian churches, churches of Christ. And yet they're not, they're not in an orthodox position. See what I'm saying? So... That's, that's a practical example of if we don't deal with the very nature of God, the, the full humanity of God, and the reason why this matters, these things happen. And it's happened in our lifetime. So, last one. On that, that asshole, it's the Virgin Mary, and if God used her, her egg or whatever, that 
that she, when Jesus said, I inherited the sin nature of a human. You know, I mean, what, what would you say to someone like that? The, the Holy Spirit would overshadow that ability to sin? Um, I, well, I, I don't know that it was, it, would, it wouldn't have been an egg because it would have had to have been an egg donor. Yeah. Yeah, the spirit. Yeah. And so the, the conception is, is that um, God used Mary, Mary's womb. And um, so what takes place there as, as, is as miraculous as God breathing life into Adam or creating Eve from the rib of Adam or something like that. Um, that's almost unexplainable. That's divine, a completely divine act. Jesus be on the lineage of David, though, without using Mary's physical... No, that, well, that, that's a whole other thing, though. Now you're talking about the, the propensity for God to... It all worked out according to Scripture, according to Scripture, according to Scripture, according to Scripture. She is from the... She, they are from the line of the Benjamin, from the, the, from the descendants of David. All of these things lined up. So she wasn't just... In some cases, she was arbitrarily chosen but not, not so much because, because it, was, it was the fulfillment in the line of David, the, the root of Jesse, and, and all the way back and when uh, the, that, that my, heel, the, my heel will crush the serpent's uh, head. Oh, it's all, all falls in line. All falls in line. A physical egg was used, though, to get the no. biological or no. just her body was saved? No, he was, she, was, she was a surrogate mother of God. Yeah. Yeah. But but it but still happened, and she still gave birth to, to Christ. Well, thank thank you for your participation. Next week there'll be a test. No. Just kidding.